Hi everyone, thanks for coming. Um, it's a great honor today to be hosting um, Karen Mills. Uh, so as a brief uh, introduction uh, for Karen, um, Karen served in President Obama's uh, cabinet as the administrator of the US Small Business Administration from 2009 to 2013 and was also a member of uh, President Obama's National Eco uh, Economic Committee. Uh, at the SBA, uh, she did many a wonderful thing, uh, but crucially, she managed a loan guarantee portfolio of over 100 billion US dollars. Um, she also took decisive uh, steps in the great, great recession to yield record-breaking years of the SBA lending and investment in growth capital. Currently, Karen is a senior fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School and the Harvard Business School and uh, is a leading authority on all matters um, pertaining to US competition, entrepreneurship, in and innovation. Um, she recently authored uh, the book, uh, which you can see on the table here, uh, FinTech, Small Businesses, and the American Dream. Um, it's an honor to host Karen here today, and uh, I'd like for you to all join me in a warm round of applause for Karen. Thank you for having me. Good evening. So this is a great honor to be here. Um, I am now at Harvard, and it's humbling to be at an even more august and beautiful and uh, erudite research university. So my honor, thank you very much for coming. And, and thank you for inviting me. I was hearing the history of the speakers who have been here, including uh, an artificial intelligence machine that debated. So I'm not sure I'll be as good as the machine, but we are gonna talk about artificial intelligence today. And the reason that uh, I am uh, excited about this topic is we are going to see, particularly in your generation, a transformative effect of big data and artificial intelligence. And one of the first places we will see it is not in autonomous vehicles and self-driving cars. It's going to be in financial services, in your bank account, in your pocketbook. And one of the places, um, so I'm gonna tell you a story about one sliver of the world of FinTech, small business lending. And we can have, through that, I think a broader debate about the principles that we need to think about as we enter this new age. So, because I'm at Harvard Business School, let's see if I can make this click, yeah. Um, I am going to start with a pop quiz. Now, Harvard Business School, we call on people. We can cold call, so, but you can volunteer. So here is the question for you all. I am going to show you here the 10 top companies in the US in terms of size in 2008. And the question for you is how many were on this list 10 years later in 2018? How many? In the back. Four. What about you? Three. Two. Two. Six. Okay, between two and six. What, what do you see? Eight. Okay, we have the full array. Um, hmm? Five. Okay, finally we get to five. Oh, wait a minute, we have President Obama. Forget. Um, five. The answer is five. So, but look who is on the list now. It's five, but instead of Exxon and General Electric, Ex General Electric, the top ones are Apple, Google, Microsoft. And as you keep going down the list, you see something else. Two banks are on here, JP Morgan and Bank of America. So financial services are going to be one of the key places that you are gonna see this combination 
of technology and the impact and the change, the transformation that I'm going to talk about. So let me start the story with um, my personal journey. Why, why am I interested in this? Why do I write this book? I am a venture capitalist. I've been a venture capitalist for, for 30 years. Um, but in 2009, I had the chance to take a new job. I went to work for the President of the United States, Barack Obama, in the beginning of his first term. And um, it was an absolutely extraordinary experience. So I got to ride, hmm, ride on Air Force One. That was really fun. And the best part of the job is that I was the person in the cabinet responsible for all of America's entrepreneurs and small business owners. I don't know what I'm saying to him, but he looks really unhappy with me in that picture. So, um, Now, there was only one problem with this job, my timing. January 2009 was the height of the Great Recession. Banks had gotten overextended with bad mortgages, and across the U.S. and the U.K., and we're going to come back to the U.K., um, they just stopped lending to small businesses. So this is the moment that I joined. This is a graph of small business job loss on the red line and big business job loss on the blue line. And you can see that in the first quarter that I was in office, we lost 1.8 million small business jobs. When banks stopped lending to small businesses, they had to contract, they had to almost shut down. So I was a venture capitalist. I didn't know any better. I wasn't a politician. So I went to the White House and I said, look, my people are getting crushed. We have to do something bold. And Larry Summers, who was the head of the National Economic Council, and President Obama let me do something, in retrospect, that I'm not sure they should have let me do, but uh, it was unproven, but they let me raise the guarantee rate for SBA loans to 90%. Now, the SBA doesn't make loans. The Small Business Administration, which I was the head of, um, has an ability to guarantee loans. And we um, realized that no banks were lending. But when we said we would guarantee 90% of the loans, we got 1,000 banks back to SBA lending in six months. It was like turning on a faucet. I call it the hockey stick that did happen. And one of the things this taught me was how important small business was to the economy and how important access to capital was to small businesses. Now, you say, really, small businesses are so important to the economy? Isn't it, you know, tech businesses? Oh, I'm doing a bad job here. OK. Um, it turns out half the people who work in this country, in my country, it's actually 60% in this country, own or work for a small business. 50, 60, in the EU, 70, 80% of the jobs. So I used to say I went to sleep worrying about half of America's jobs. And there's another problem with small business. People think of small business as only high-tech companies. When you think about entrepreneurs, you think immediately, well, the only important entrepreneurs are the ones who are creating all the life sciences companies all around Cambridge. And it turns out that they are very important because they're going to become the next Googles. But for the number of, of small businesses, in the US, there's 30 million small businesses. Only about 200,000 are these kind of high-tech companies that venture capital um, funds. The rest are either sole proprietorships. Of the 30 million, 24 million are sole proprietorships. And the numbers in the UK, the proportions are actually the same. 
and the rest of them are either suppliers or they're these, we call them Main Street, you call them High Street small businesses. So you might think, how are they contributing to the economy? They're only just local businesses, but they are the job generators and, I will argue, in a lot of ways, the way people get access and opportunity, the way they pursue what we call the American dream. So what's the problem? Well, the problem is that getting a loan for these businesses has been painful. It is a slow process. You Xerox a pile of paperwork, and you carry it down to your bank, and you give it to the loan officer, and the loan officer says, no, or come back in three months. Or, my personal favorite, how about giving me your personal guarantee in your house as collateral for this loan. So the two frictions in this process that I've described, we economists have named for. The first is information opacity. If I ask you 10 questions about you, I can tell whether you should get a mortgage. But if I ask you 10 questions about your business, I can't even tell if you're making any money. Big data has the ability to solve this problem. So you see where I'm going. And the second problem is heterogeneity. I showed you that chart of all the different small businesses. Well, one day you're lending to a dry cleaner, the next day a parts supplier, the next day to a funeral home. Big data, though, has the ability to create a file of a thousand dry cleaners. So if you see the thousandth and first, you can pretty well tell whether it's a good dry cleaner or a bad dry cleaner. And so if you think about this new world, we are going to be able to change by reducing all these frictions and barriers the ability of small businesses to access capital. That is the new landscape for small business lending. This has been going on now for less than 10 years, and already it's full. So now we play the second part of my questioning of you. You all need to pick one of these categories to answer the question, who are going to be the winners in this new world of fintech? And the candidates I have for you today are the banks, because they have customers, and they have deposits, they have a lot of money. They might not be as tech savvy, but what about big tech? Amazon, Square, PayPal. What about fintech, challenger banks? How many of you have an account with a fintech? Yeah, all right, I can see which are, where you're going. And then I, I have a last category here, which is called infrastructure. So these are people, the example I use is Plaid, who provide the piping for all the data, who provide the tech platforms, and they sell them either to the banks or to other companies. So who wants to vote for the banks? Who thinks the banks are going to be the winners? I got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Hmm? Oh, how do you define it? This, I get this question all the time. And of course I say, however you define the winner, all right? However you think that winning in this environment, is it the people who gain all the share, people who get all the money, people you'd like to invest in? By your definition, okay, I got seven people for the banks, eight people for the banks, that's good, big tech. Okay, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. Okay, uh, fintechs. Well, what about all of you people who are banking with them? Okay, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Okay, and what about the infrastructure companies? Okay, a few, probably 11. Um, usually, and it's very often the same, big tech gets a lot of votes here because you know we see in China already Alibaba and Alipay have taken over this market. Um, but one of the interesting questions here, I think, is could the banks 
by using some of these infrastructure companies play and compete because they already have the lowest cost deposits. Remember, they have money that is very cheap and they have customers. So keep this in mind. Now, why is all this happening now? And the reason that it's happening now is that the ability of APIs to suck up data from your bank account, your credit cards, all of your uh, information is new. This didn't exist more than t 10 years ago. And the ability of artificial intelligence to create algorithms that separate out creditworthy borrowers from not creditworthy borrowers is also sort of the, the, the cutting edge technology. But what's interesting about this is not only will it create lender insights, this is gonna create something I call in the book, small business utopia. This creates, imagine if you're a small business and you have a dashboard that tells you by looking inside all of your bank account in all of your credit card data, it says, you know what? You are going to need $7,000 in three weeks in order to pay payroll. But don't worry, you're going to generate enough, enough cash flow after Christmas to pay it back. It tells your bank the same thing, and on the middle of that dashboard, there is a button and it says, press here, you are pre-approved for $7,000. In this scenario, a small business owner could have much more confidence in going ahead and growing their business because they've already got the capital and they've got um, insight into their business they didn't have before. So maybe the failure rate goes down. What kind of impact did that have on the economy? What's the problem with this great utopian situation I just described? Well. This is the issue I want you to go home thinking about. It turns out if you've got big data, you're gonna have all these algorithms. Who gets to look inside the algorithm? What if the algorithm says that you are not credit worthy and it has a mistake in it? Today, there are certain rules that you can go back in your credit score and you can say there's an error. Who gets to do that if it's machine learning? What if the machine learns on a set of data that has bias in it? We know today that women-owned businesses and minority-owned businesses get less capital. If it trains on today's data, it's going to have the same bias. Who owns that data? Well, here in the UK, you have created some policies that I would like the US to emulate. The EU and the UK have said, you own your data. And they've said that it must be permissioned to these dashboards if you say so. If you give permission for your data to be uploaded, it must happen, open banking. In the US, I asked a treasury official, who owns my bank data? And the answer I got was, it's murky. Murky is a bad answer in regulation. And you can see why. This is the US regulatory system. We have seven regu federal regulators over small business banking. And you have a much better and clearer system. I am spending a lot of time being an ambassador for the UK banking regulation system because I think we should copy what the UK has done. So let me conclude with a couple thoughts. Who's going to be the winners and losers? I hinted at this. The ones who have the customers and the recognized brands. The ones who provide the capital. And the ones who provide the technology. Who's that going to be? What do I predict? I actually think that the banks have a big chance of winning here. And in the US, we have 5,000 community banks. And they used to provide relationship banking, advice and counsel. Imagine 
if they had plug and play technology, they could go back to being relationship bankers. So that's my wish and hope for the US industry. Here, I think you've got much more of a chance of having some challenger banks have some success, but their problem is very high cost money, and that's making for very high cost loans, which is perhaps not good for small business owners. So who wins in the end? I think the small business owner wins. More small business owners get to um, get loans who are credit worthy, and there's more access and opportunity. Because I'm here at Cambridge, I had to um, go back in time and find out when was the first small business loan ever made. And the answer is 3,000 years ago in Mesopotamia. And um, I, in fact, went to the British Museum and got pictures of all of these uh, coins, which they used to use. Um, they used to use bits of silver to make these loans. It is documented on one of those tablets that there was a royal um, baker, and he got a loan from someone acting as a banker, and the loan was at under 4%. But there was another set of documents about some fishermen, and their loans were 20% a month. So we know that there is a long history of frictions and barriers and disparate behavior in small business lending. And I am an optimist, though. I think that we might be at a transformational moment where technology has the ability to solve these problems. And if it's true, then we are going to be able to create more access, more opportunity, and perhaps restore the ability of people to um, come to a country like this, like America, and achieve what we call the American dream, the ability to provide, open a business, prosper, provide for their family, and succeed. So thank you for having me.